test. All right, folks, it's 7 o'clock, so now we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. I want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring tonight's event. I want to thank the Book Oasis in Stoneham for providing the books. I believe they're on their way. I also want to thank Tewksbury Telemedia uh, for live streaming and recording tonight's event. Okay? Uh, restrooms are down the hall on the right before you get to the front desk. Uh, I anticipate tonight's program wrapping up somewhere between 8.15 and 8.30, okay? And again, no, no pressure, no obligation, but if you want to buy the book afterwards, uh, copies will be available, and uh, Steve and Brian will be more than happy to sign them for you, okay? All right, so uh, let me uh, introduce our guest speakers tonight. And first, I'm going to introduce Brian. Uh, Brian, uh, cogn how, do, how am I doing this? Cottagon. 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 Brian. Brian C. Brian C. is here, everyone. He's the associate curator of the Sports Museum at uh, TD Garden in Boston. He's also a cartoonist, historian, a sports historian, military historian, reenactor, a washed up hockey player. I'm sure there's several of those in the room. Yeah, uh, and he is, uh, he's the author of several books, including uh, The Hartford Whalers, The Boston Garden, and The Bruins in Black and White, Volumes 1 and 2. And he's also the creator of the comic uh, strips Misfits, S1019, and In the Zone. Okay, I'm going to end that there. And uh, let me introduce Steve now, um, real briefly. Um, and of course, the Nesson clip will do most of this, so I'll be brief here. Uh, Steve uh, Babineau uh, is the uh, co-author, along with Brian, of the brand new book, Behind the Lens, the World Hockey Association 50 Years Later. And Steve has previously served as team photographer for the Boston Red Sox, the Boston Celtics, and of course, uh, currently also the Boston Bruins. In addition, uh, he has served as the campus sports photographer for UMass Lowell and Boston University. City. He has photographed countless concerts and special events at the Boston Garden. And, oh, I have to read this part. So, his decades of work and involvement as an employee, as a contractor, and a fan has literally paid off in diamonds. Since 2007, Steve has earned championship rings with all five organizations I just mentioned. No other photographer in North America has accomplished this, okay? You can fact check me, but I'm pretty sure, right? Uh, let's see here. The NH because of his work in photography, the, N the NHL, uh, was, he was singled out by the league back in 2007 when it acquired his collection of 350,000 images. Uh, his images have appeared in countless, ma countless magazines, and he's the author of three books, including Black and Gold, Four Decades of the Boston Bruins and Photographs, The Hometown Team, Four Decades of Boston Red Sox Photography, and most recently, the aforementioned Behind the Lens, The World Hockey Association 50 Years Later. Okay, well, I've talked more than I planned, <laughs> so now we're going to get started with, a, with an int a video introduction that was recently produced by Nesson. Okay, so here we go. And I'm going to turn the lights off. You're going to click it up, though. Yeah, I'm going to click it up. <laughs> Let me give this back to you. So it's His easy. computer, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> first version they sent me, they didn't show the guys going back in the studio. Wait till you see the guys going back into the studio and what they say. Okay. I bring my camera in. I just wanted to take home something from the games that I was going to 
came up with a bedroom wall. Uh, and my next door neighbor used to give me the hockey news. And he was the hockey news I was getting it. It was four pages of editorial and the hockey news. And it was like really no main action photos. It seemed like it was all publicity photos from training camp. You know, that first year because they had to play that many games. And I remember going up to mom and asking mom if I could make a long distance phone call to my show. And I really think back now and she said no. <laughs> you wouldn't be sitting here. Placing a long distance phone call to Montreal. Unbelievably, Charlie Halpin, the editor of the hockey, was on the phone. And I said, Mr. Halpin, I'm mad at you. the newspaper I get from my next door neighbor. You've got no game action photos. Kate, we don't have it. Do you have it? I go, yeah, I'm going to games and I'm taking my camera and it's turning it, but you know, send me up. So we set the dock on the mom and dad's bathroom that night in Fort Square, Cambridge. And uh, put it up to five by seven pictures, throwing it in the sink, then into the bathtub, and they hang them up. And no one on the camera, and no clue what to expect. And then I remember it's probably about two and a half, three weeks later, next door neighbor is by, I think he might have this one. And I had two pictures blown up, Bobby Sheehan, Tim Sheehy. Local labs, our own local lab, the old guys paid a whopping two dollars and fifty cents a piece. But Mr. Halpin called me back and said, Hey kid, I'm gonna get you a season credential that we need to call the listening that you can get. I went to work, they told me to go, you know, I'm Jerry Buck the hour well with the Bruins photographers and they kinda like focus on so the WHA as well and got to keep moving forward. And I just went to work, they told me to go. And then you know Started getting published more. You know, well, so then the, next, the season was getting ready to start. And I called Mr. Alpha up and I basically said, Mr. Alpha, what's your name, Austin Roberts? Oh, you know, tough the other guy here, you know, but uh, let me see what I can do by getting you some games. Well, no one will, they decided to just give me a season credential. And if I was going to get pumped, they were going to call me. And I never called. And I found myself in shooting while he was last two years. Yeah, I mean, again, being a diehard Bruin fan growing up and these guys going to that league, it was another reason to go to the games. You're just seeing these guys that you saw playing with the original team, winning the Stanley you know, winning the Stanley Cup. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was, to me, it was an avenue just to follow the game. Bring home something, and then the next thing you know, the break with the hockey news, you know, that led to Bruins game, and, you know, the Bruins let me do technically whatever I wanted to do as long as I kept them supplied with the pictures that they need. Once again, the book is called Behind the Lens, the World Hockey Association. Oh, I love looking at those pictures. I have books in my basement that I got as a child. And a few of them, the ones about the mask men and the origination of the golden mask and everything, those kind of books. I would still find myself going out there like the absolute hockey geek nerd that I am. And I would open them up and read the pictures like I cannot wait. I literally, if I could have it here right now, I'd let you guys just go talk and I would go out and read the whole thing. I can't wait to see this book in person. The book is available now in stores or every buying a book store in Billy Captain's face. <laughs> <laughs> That was pretty, I only saw the video, I didn't see the end of the video, you know, when, when, it, when it was broadcast, and then when I saw the end of the video and I saw those guys, that's Andrew Raycroft who played for the Bruins as a goaltender, and then he got, we traded Andrew Raycroft for Tuka Rask, and uh, 
you know, he's a broadcaster, and you know, sometimes I'm going through the archive and finding stuff of these guys from the past, and uh, I just send him an email, and they kind of freak out that I still think of them, you know what I mean? So it's pretty cool. I want to introduce Brian Cardigan here, okay? He'll give you a little intro here about kind of like maybe how we met, and sure. we, we both sleep in the garden. <laughs> Hello? Is this working? Anyway, yeah, I've known, God, now how many years I've known you long before I was working at the Garden. Yes. But, um, yeah, the thing is, with this particular project, unlike, say, an ongoing thing like the Bruins, the Red Sox, WHA had a beginning, a middle, and an end. So it really is the whole history of it. And it's unique because you shot the whole history of it. And um, the teams, it's a very colorful league. The teams came and went. So the Whalers started out here in uh, Boston at the Garden. Then they ended up moving to Hartford. Then they moved to Carolina, which is too bad. But um, no, I said one thing about the league is that it boosted salaries. Uh, guys had a chance to play who hadn't before. And it was one of those things that we, was WHA first or Bruins? WHA was first. Was first, WHA, yeah, because they played at the Garden. And um, like I said, it was kind of a, a gypsy league. Teams moved around a lot. And it was tough to find pictures, like the Baltimore Blades, where they exist for like six months or something. I think it was four and a half. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting thing that, um, like I said, you see the picture of the referee with the idiotic red and blue. They always do that with upstart leagues. Like they made blue pucks at one point. Yep. They had, you know, they dressing them like fools. But the thing is, though, it really had a positive impact on the players because they didn't have the, res the, uh, the restrictions that they had. They could sign younger players like Wayne Gretzky, we'll talk about him later. Yep. And uh, they, uh, so they had free agency. And it's not like today, where you're making five million off you five and a half. These guys are making 20,000, and they'd offer you 60,000. You're gonna take it. Or Bobby Hull, they offered him a million dollars, and didn't work out well for Derek Sanderson. No. 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 He, he, he made it, he, he, well, it worked out, didn't work out his playing career, but it, uh, he got the money. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So um, what's interesting, like I said, what I find interesting about this is it's a, a piece of history that a lot of people don't know about. They don't know a lot of these teams. They know Gordy Howe came out of retirement to play with his sons, and he played to, what, 52, I think, or 53. He was the only active NHL player who was also a grandfather. You don't see that much anymore. <laughs> and uh, Bobby Hull, you know, the, he, he actually joked about that. He said, he was a little contract dispute with Chicago, said, yeah, if they give me a million bucks, I'll play. They said, okay. <laughs> so, but he was like the first, that was the big thing to get him. Because you needed big names, big stars, not just minor leaguers and such. But a lot of guys, they did, because when the leagues merged, well, I don't know if it's a merger or not, but the four teams were absorbed by the NHL. A lot of guys were still playing guys like Dave Keon and Gordie Howe and even Bobby Hull. So they were able to come back and basically play out their careers there. So um, I think what else to mention here, but the... Uh, oh. it's just, it took us two years, it took us, it took us about, it took me two years to put this thing together. I, I didn't even get in touch with him until I had spent probably a year just looking through this, <laughs> the film and then I realized, okay, I almost got this down except for three teams. I didn't have the Baltimore Blades, the Calgary Cowboys, and the Ottawa Civics. And if you look back at their history, they only lasted about four months, five months, and then they folded or moved. So the book will show you the representation of them because I had a historian up in Canada that was a madhouse collector. And he would have publicity photos of the Baltimore Blades team photo, a ticket stub, a press guide, and he let me scan them, and I incorporated that into the franchise chapter of that franchise. I would hop, skip, and jump. Yeah. Oh, there was, was it, was it Ottawa? They Ottawa City. They, they didn't find out that the city, the town, had, that the team had moved until they, they landed at the airport and it was in a different <laughs> city. Things like that happened a lot, you know. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was colorful. It, was a, it gave retired players in the NHL that were on their way out an opportunity to play another one or two years. You know, and uh, not too many rookies, you know, other than uh, Mark Messier and Gretzky and Kenny Linsman uh, come to my mind as 18 years old players that ended up starting in that league. Uh, there wasn't too many. Uh, Robbie Fatora, college kid. Dave Silk, college kid. 
uh, from around here, ended up playing in that league. So, but it was either you're at the end of your career or, you know, you're going to catch on. The team didn't want to sign you for that money. But all of a sudden, somebody's throwing $50,000 at you to come and play when you're only making twenty five. I think you're going to go for it. You know what I mean? Exactly. And Gordy, Gordy had the opportunity to play with his sons. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, the, uh, I was going to say, the, a lot of the, they'd opened it up for a lot of college players, as you said, because they didn't really, most of the guys came from junior, not from college, and more importantly, the Europeans. Because yes. if you look at the, the 16 league, it was like 99% Canadian, a couple Americans. And after that, they, they didn't think they could play the American, North American game. The Swedes. Turns out they proved them wrong. Hedberg, and, Hedberg, Nilsson, yeah, with Winnipeg, Vlad Klafnadimanski with the Toronto Toros, uh, fantastic players. You know, fantastic players, and uh, you know, it just grew from there. It, it revolution. I, I don't want to say revolutionized, but it changed the game of hockey for the NHL to open their eyes and say, hey, you know, we can get these players from overseas that are almost as good, you know, they don't probably play as fit, they're not physical, that's not the game in Europe, it wasn't physical. So that's, that was the way that the NHL kind of tried to control those guys by playing physical against them. Uh, and, uh, you know, I remember my favorite player, European back in that day, was Boya Salming, the, oh, Toronto, yeah. the Toronto defenseman. He was incredible, big, tall, like Shara, you know, he could skate, he could pass. Really tough too. And he, 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 take, he took a beating because the other teams went after him. He took a beating every night. Yeah. And, you know, he w wasn't a fighter. He just took it, absorbed it, and made a nice pass to the guy to score a goal. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, it, uh, it worked out. So. It was probably, when you think about it, when it came along in 72, 73, the biggest thing since the original expansion from yep. six teams to 12. Yep. Because it really opened again, created a lot of jobs. At the time, there were only six teams for a long time. And it was dominated by Toronto, Detroit, and Montreal. And the rest, it was like them and the rest, like Gilligan's Island, you know. But then it became more balanced. Bob Yor came along, as you said. The Bruins became, they went from losing, not being in the playoffs eight straight years to within, what, three years they won a Stanley Cup. Yep. So it just, uh, this is sort of like an amazing thing, so. All righty. So, what I got here is a little little uh, tidbit thing on photos of the WHA, and this obviously, if you heard the story, I bought six game package, seven game package to the WHA. I was six row balcony behind the goal, and this basically is the photo. I'm going to say it probably is the first photo that I took of the WHA in that first game, and it was the national anthem from my balcony seat. Okay, and it's the Whalers wearing the circle logo versus the W with the harpoon that later later changed. And that's Bill Friday, who was kind of like a comic referee in a roundabout way. But uh, uh, this is something I just put together just from uh, program covers uh, of the league. Gordy there, Teddy Green with Blue Line. There's Uvari, like it, look, it almost looked like he's looking right at me. And I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty far away from him with a long lens, but it looks like he's looking right at me. And uh, just put that together as like a little bit of an intro. So here's a good example of the old Boston Garden, okay? And if I'm blocking your view, please hit me in the head, okay? Uh, this is the old Boston Garden. You can see, look how close those photographers are together with holes in the glass. The NHL controls that now. There's only eight holes allowed in the glass. But in the old garden, I remember there was probably 14, okay? And, you know, that's not plexiglass. That's real glass right there, okay? You know, so... Uh, there's a hole right there with two, one pane of glass with two holes in it. But uh, this would be one of the first games. This was the New York Raiders, a guy by the name of Perry playing for the New York Raiders. But this is where I moved down from my balcony seat and I got under the balcony in the stadium just with like a 135 millimeter lens and was just sh shooting stuff. And, uh, but again, look at, you see the texture of the film? See the grain in the film there, right? You can identify with that, right? <laughs> I mean, that was, the garden was unbalanced from a lighting standpoint, if you're if any of your photographers. It had three banks of lights on this side of the rink because this was the TV side and there was only two banks of lights on that side. So there was a blue tinge that went with the photography when you shot it. And when I eventually got in with the Bruins, I figured out how to correct that by putting a filter on my lens. This would be me now moving down to a hole position 
okay? And uh, Tim Sheehy right there against the Houston Arrows. Look at the seats. The seats are red cushion seats in the garden before they took all those out and they put those plastic yellow seats in the garden. <laughs> okay, but that's me with like a 135 millimeter lens, you know, shooting uh, game action photography, you know. I became friends with Tim. He, was, uh, he became an agent later on. This would be at the Boston Arena where the Bruins originally started in 1924, 1928, where I played my high school hockey for Ringe Tech. Okay, we played our varsity games over there. But uh, that's the Alberta Oilers right there, that guy going behind the net with that color uniform. That's Ted Green of the Bruins, Al Smith goaltender, and that's Tommy Williams over there who played for the Bruins and went on to the Minnesota North Stars back in the day. But you can see now the crowd, look at the balcony. Nobody's at front row balcony seats. You'd think somebody would be up there, you know what I mean? But there's nobody there. And uh, kids could stand right behind where the doors opened up there, right there, just stand right there on the painted glass. And, uh, but that's me now. And I, if I'm remembering correctly right now, there wasn't holes in, in the glass in the Boston Arena. So this is me shooting through the actual glass. And Tommy Williams was an American and an Olympian, which is pretty yep. rare in those days. Yep. Here's that first game I went to, and there's Derek Sanderson coming over the blue line to take a slap shot. <laughs> okay. But this is basically just me with a 50 millimeter lens. That's all I had in those days was a 50 millimeter lens and I'm shooting down. And Turk only played what, eight games, nine games? Eight games, eight games in the WHA and walked away with a million dollars in his pocket and uh, ended up coming back to the Bruins wearing number 17, not number 16. There was a player wearing number 16 and they didn't give him number 16. They, gave it, they gave it to the rookie <laughs> instead, so. Yeah. But that's Turk, yeah, that's Turk, that's Paul Hurley right there, the defenseman, lo another local lad. L.A. Sharks, this is Mark Tardif, who went on to play for the Quebec Nordiques uh, when the leagues merged. Or he went to Quebec in the WHA, and then the Quebec Nordiques came into the NHL as one of the franchises. But again, Boston Garden, you know, you can see the texture of the film there, the grain. Uh, he was a pretty good player. He was a pretty good player. What that, that, that lens right there is probably, that, that probably is a 80 to 200 millimeters, 80 to 200 millimeter lens right there. I know when I first, when I first was going to games, I only had one camera. And then that first year when I was published maybe seven or eight times, and they got me the position at ice level, I only had really a 50 millimeter lens. So I could literally go from here yeah. to that painting, to that painting right there, to the goal. And they always, the photographers in the old days, a la Bobby Orr, going behind the net and coming out like this, they wanted to be on the face-off circle hole so they could see behind the net as Espo and Orr were coming out, okay? And they always took those three panes of glass there. And because I was the rookie, they thought they were giving me a lousy position. But they were giving me the corner hole, which I couldn't shoot behind the goal. But I still had the goaltender. When the goaltender's like this and he's looking over me, I had that. I had the slot area, but I could see the whole game. I could visualize, even though my lens didn't get me to the red, the blue line or the red line, I just visualized the game in this, you know, what the players were doing, how, they, and I played hockey, so I mean, you know, I tell the story that when I got a 300 millimeter lens and I'm looking through the lens and I'm really tight, I could actually almost tell which way the guy was gonna curl by looking straight right into his face. I knew he was going to come, I'm home over there, and he's skating up the boards like this, and I knew he was going to come towards me like that. Boom. Get the picture. So, again, another crazy thing that happened, after that first year, somebody broke into my mom and dad's apartment. Poor square camera. Stole a strong box out of the back room and stole my camera. And I figured, Psst. but dad, God bless him, he threw like 600 bucks on the table back in 1973. And that allowed me to get a Super DM Topcon camera, T-O-P-C-O-N, Super DM camera, motor drive, 50 millimeter lens, and I was able to buy a 135 millimeter lens, which now got me to the blue line, okay? But now I could multiple fire, not that I wanted to, because it was only 36 exposures on a roll of film, and you know, you wanna make sure you're in focus if you're gonna push that button, you know what I mean? You don't wanna waste film, but the bottom line was, that changed it. And then next thing you know, I'm in shooting the Bruins. And now I'm getting published more. Now I'm making $2.50 times, you know, maybe, I don't know, 40, 50 pictures. But 
the next lens I bought was a, a, an 80 to 200. And I couldn't afford the Topcon, so I had to go with Vivitar. I went with a Vivitar 135 and a Vivitar 80 to 200, which worked on that camera. And I'll tell you about the other lens, maybe in my, if I can find some here. But this is Jim Dory of the Toronto Maple Leafs and Brad Selwood, who played for the Toronto Maple Leafs. The guy in the middle with the yellow shirt is Reggie Fleming, who was basically a bruiser with the Chicago Blackhawks, and he jumped to the Chicago Cougars. And that's Tommy Williams with the A on the shirt back there. But the Whalers had a, you know, they won the, they won the trophy the first year. They won the Avco Cup the first, first year. They had a great defensive core, great goaltender in Al Smith. And they had some scoring talent, you know, with uh, Tommy Williams up front. But the key here in this picture is look how low the glass is. Okay? So me as a high school kid going in to see Bobby Orr, buying obstructed view seats, I would go down to the glass during warm-up, being six foot, those days I was six foot four, I'm only like six three now, but I, I, would, I would be right over the top of the glass with nothing blocking me, and I'd be able to shoot warm-ups of uh, the Bruins or the Red Wings or the Blackhawks or whatever. And this is the Toronto Toros, and Al Smith, I think Al Smith got clocked in the net and he went chasing after the guy. But I mean, you know, that, that one girl's got her hands over the, both elbows over the glass like that. It's like unbelievable. This is Robbie Fatorik from Needham. Went on to play for, uh, this is the Cincinnati Stingers. Went on to play in Quebec and he ended up coaching the Boston Bruins. And, uh, and eventually became a scout. I'm not sure if he's still scouting today, but I remember running into him a couple years ago and he was still scouting. We were in the elevator at the garden together. But, uh, you know, the old Lang helmet, that's what I wore. I wore that type of helmet when I played, when I played hockey too. That was, uh, they called, it was a Lang, made by Lang, L-A-N-G-E. Jerry Cheevers, you know, left the Bruins, jumped to that league because they were paying him more money. You know, and uh, he became a, you know, he held that team together pretty good. Uh, I don't think he probably liked playing as many games as he did, but uh, he, he, he played a lot. But then when they were going to move, because they had to move, they were moving the franchise, he came back to the Bruins. And he wore number 31. Wore number 31. Dave Reese, I think, was number 30. Dave Reese was wearing number 30 for us at that time. This is Ektachrome 400, and based on the arena that I'm in, it varied. You know, if I was in the garden, it was a certain exposure. If I was in uh, the Boston arena, I probably had to push it to film a quarter of a stop. You know, uh, I remember going to the Hartford Civic Center the first time, and it was like I thought I was going into heaven because it just seemed like it was so much brighter, you know, and all of a sudden, uh, you know. But the, the one thing that I learned, <laughs> this is the one thing that was insane that it took me probably about a year to figure this out was I didn't g grasp, you, you know, you'd shoot a game on Saturday and I'd bring my film into the lab on Monday. I'd shoot a game on Thursday or, or one, a Tuesday, I'd bring it into the lab on Wednesday and pick it up on Thursday. And you're in the same building shooting at the same exposure, right? But the film didn't look right. It was, it, it, it was different. And it wasn't until this photo lab up on Mount Arm Street, complete photo, uh, up on Mount Armand Street, right? Uh, a good friend of mine, Armin, Armin you know, he, I think you know Armin, right? I said, I'm using the same exposure here. What's going on here? Why does this film look different on Tuesday than on, than on Saturday? And he says, oh, don't you realize we only mix chemicals once a week and we mix them on Monday morning. So if your film is brought in on Monday or Tuesday, it's going to look a hell of a lot different than it is on Friday and Saturday. And I, you know, because think about, they're using the same chemicals and they're processing hundreds of rolls of film. So that was a rookie's mistake. But, uh, you know, a lot of those pictures that look like crap, I ended up converting to black and white, you know, and using them as black and white images. Is Gordy Howe playing for Houston again? That's Tommy Abrahamson, that number 19. He was a defenseman, and his brother, Christer, was a goaltender for the Whalers back then. And this this would be this particular shot right here it is in the Hartford Civic Center, which obviously was you can see just by the brightness that it was a lot better lit. 
So in the book, at the end of the franchise chapters, I've created this little section called collage, pa collage pages, where, yeah, I've got lots of photos of Hull, Hedberg, Nilsson, Gordy, Marty, Mark, certain players, you know, because those are the players that were the marketability ones. But I shot a lot of players that might have only played 40 games. And I felt that it was important that I take this collage section and if I have a picture of this guy, track him down who he is, find out his statistics, and put his statistics in there because he's probably going to buy a book. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If he's in the book. But then I did something like this where I created this, and these would be the statistics that the Howes accumulated playing for the Houston Arrows, not the Whalers. When they left the Houston and came to the Whalers, I have a page for them on the Whalers section that shows the statistics there. So, you know, and in the book, there's a section called The Gems, where I had these extra pictures of star players that I decided to, we decided to create this section called The Gems, which was picking three players on a particular team or three players in general. So there's a section for these guys known as the first family, okay? And then we have the local lads, which would be Sheehan, uh, Fatorik, and Hurley you know, as local lads, and then uh, the Swedes, you know what I mean, or the, the, the El Toros, for the guys that play for the Toronto Toros. But this is a unique photo, getting Gordy Howe and Bobby Hull in one picture, you know, and I couldn't believe I actually got this. I'm sitting at a whole corner, there's the net right there, and they just curled in the corner, and Gordy's getting ready to trip Bobby right there. <laughs> Johnny Pye McKenzie, uh, after he played for Philadelphia, uh, he went to the Minnesota Fighting Saints, and then he ended up coming to the Whalers, the, which were playing out of Hartford at that time. Vancouver yeah, Vancouver Blazers, yes. Philadelphia to Vancouver, and then, then to the Fighting Saints. Al Smith again, as that Alberta Oiler jersey there, that's Teddy Green. You can see this is another game, but you can now see the seats starting to be a little empty there. Uh, this is Teddy going to the WHA after he had that high sticking incident playing for the Bruins and got a fractured skull, and he ended up uh, going there. And then he finished his career with the Winnipeg Jets in the WHA, and he didn't wear a helmet when he played for the Winnipeg Jets, So, which I thought was kind of risky. but. Uh, J.C. Tremblay, Montreal Canadian star back in the day. This would be Quebec that first year with that style uniform. Uh, he, he was the captain. Uh, he was a great defenseman playing for the Canadians when they won all those Stanley Cups back in the day. But again, you can see the grain there a little bit, you know. Quebec's sort of focused on signing French Canadians. Yep, yes. Paul Henderson. You know, the famous guy that took that photo, uh, scored that goal for Team Canada that beat the Russians uh, going to this team. Uh, the Toronto Toros, they played in Toronto and then they eventually were forced to move, I guess. Uh, Howard Ballard, Howard Ballard was uh, kind of like, didn't want them playing in Maple Leaf Gardens. So they moved and I couldn't believe they actually went to the Birmingham, Alabama. Became, you know, <laughs> playing hockey. hockey. Alabama, a lot of players like Keon. Yep. Yeah, so this is down in uh, this is down in Hartford also. Bobby Hull, uh, first this is the first year with uh, with that Jets logo. They wore this for one and a half years, this logo, and then they changed to the circle. But this is actually down in uh, Madison Square Garden. It was a cha Challenge Cup where they brought the Whalers, the Jets, uh, Gordy Howe's team, Houston, and the New York Golden Blades. The first year they were known as the New York Raiders. Then they became the New York Golden Blades and they wore white skates. With Golden Blades. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that team ended up playing like that. Then they went to New Jersey, became the New Jersey Knights. Then they went to San Diego, became the San Diego Mariners. And then they became the second version of the Minnesota Fighting Saints. When the other team, Minnesota team, folded, that owner decided to take them out to Minnesota where hockey is hockey, you know what I mean, in a roundabout way. But again, you talk about photography, is somebody, I'm going into that building, into a foreign object building, are the photographers there gonna tell me what the exposure is? Are they gonna tell me what the lighting is? No, that was top secret, that was top secret. You know, his, who the hell is this kid right here? Who's this guy, who's this guy? Well, shooting daylight film in Boston, 
Springfield, okay, when I was going out shooting, I brought daylight film. And it turned out the lighting in the building was tungsten. Okay, so all my pictures had this yellow tinge to it, yellow's tinge to it. And I saved a couple for the book, I corrected them in Photoshop, but I converted a lot of them to black and white to, to salvage the picture. But uh, yeah, to see, I remember my wife and I, we took the bus down, we drove down, I go to the game, my wife was kind of sitting close to where I was shooting, and uh, you know, the first game, second game, and my wife started talking with this family that was right next to her, and uh, now I'm packing up my gear, the game's over, and, and the guy looks at me and he goes, so where are you going on? I says, well, we're walking back to the bus station. You're walking back to the bus station. Uh, I think we'll walk with you <laughs> because I'm carrying this valuable equipment. <laughs> you know what I, I go, why? He says, eh, it's not in the best part of town. <laughs> and they took us back to the bus station. There's Hedberg and Nilsson of Winnipeg. You know, great players, great, great players. I think of, when I see Hedberg, I think of Pasta with us now. Uh, he had great speed, he could shoot, but imagine putting Bobby Hall on that line. You know, Bobby Hall could skate, Bobby Hall could shoot, you know what I mean? I'm sure these guys were scared out of their pants when Bobby Hall was taking a slap shot and they might be standing in front of the net, you know what I'm saying? Okay, so the last chapter in the book is called The Card. And the reason why it's called The Card, if you haven't heard, Wayne Gretzky's rookie hockey card, graded a 10, OPG version, Canadian version of Topps, that was their subsidiary, sold in an auction for $3.75 million. It's my photo. It's Gretzky playing in the WHA at 18 years old, that last year of the league before it folded. And I went down to Springfield. I got a phone call from Hockey News and Tops saying, this young kid's coming around to your neck of the woods. Any chances you can get some photos? Now, my first reaction is, where the hell are they playing? Because what ended up happening was, on Thursday night, I was shooting a game in the Hartford Civic Center. And when I left that night, I was driving in a Conaline van, Ford Conaline van, and I remember it was snowing like crazy, and the plows hadn't even got out yet. And all I remember is the, the rear of the van was just fishtailing. Sometimes I saw the rear of the van over here <laughs> in my window. And it snowed all night Friday night, Thursday night, all day Friday. There was a college basketball game on Friday night. They played it. And at 3 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, the roof of the Hartford Civic Center collapsed. And the team, the Whalers, had to relocate to Springfield, to the other Springfield, uh, not the new arena, because they already booked concerts and college games. They had to go back to the old arena that I was told Eddie, well, Eddie Shore was like the general manager back in the day of that arena, back in the day, the ex Bruins player. So my initial reaction was well, yeah, okay, they're playing in Springfield. And I thought it was the, the new building, but it wasn't. And the lighting in that building was bad. <laughs> and, I said, well, if he's playing against the Whalers, then he's playing against Gordie Howe. Yeah, we might see Gordie Howe one more time. So my real intent was to go there and see Gordie Howe. That was my real, but obviously I had to shoot Gretzky. And as soon as warm-up started, I was in the penalty box with no glass, and I'm here, shooting here, and Gretzky's right there. And I go, Wayne. I said, Steve with, Fleer, uh, with Tops and uh, the Hockey News. And I had two cameras. I had a long lens, and I had a camera with a flash on it. And he looks at me, and I picked up the camera with the flash. I go, click, boom, get this picture. And then as he turns away, he's like, boom. <laughs> so in the book, you'll see those two flash pictures. You'll see those two flash pictures in the book. But, you know, here I am in the penalty box, no glass, and here he is at the end of this period. And it's, I think it's late in the period or there's a penalty, and he's just looking up at the scoreboard, you know, to find out, you know, what's going on, the time or whatever. And I go, click. And this is my purchase order from Tops to Steve Babin on 91 Yale Street, my apartment with my wife. And these are the players that are listed here are players that came in from Quebec, Winnipeg, the four teams that came into the NHL where the uniforms did not change that first year coming into the league. The only restriction that they had with the Edmonton Oilers, you can see here this logo, you can see the size of the circle. The NHL had a requirement of how the, the dimension of the circle could be, but somehow, this slipped through. Because I already, when the, when the I, you know, when I took this picture, I did not know the league was going to fold. 
Nobody knew. And then all of a sudden the season ends and the league folds. But then I get the shot list from Tops, and here's these guys, and I just submit the pictures. And they ended up picking card number 18, 16 shots at $25 a piece. <laughs> okay. And uh, so in the book, in the chapter, I talk about uh, the last chapter is called The Card, and it opens up with this picture. Okay. And then all through the talking, you'll see all the other pictures of Gretzky that I took in that game, including a full page picture of 18 year old Wayne Gretzky against 51 year old Gordy Howe in color. And if you look at the picture really close, look at where Gordy's stick is. Gordy's stick is ready to trip him. <laughs> okay. But, you know, years went on, and, you know, yeah, okay. You don't think Gretzky's going to become Gretzky, you know, in, in, back in 1978, 79. And uh, so years go on, and then I, then I hear, okay, this, the card sold for this, the card sold for that, you know. And all of a sudden, this one comes out at 3.75 million, and, and it's like, and I was talking to Kevin DuPont, the Boston Globe, and I said, you know, you know that's my photo? He goes, what? I said, that's my photo. He goes, you've got to be kidding me. He puts a blip in the paper the next day, right? Bruins photographer. Next thing you know, Heritage Auctions is calling me up. And Steve, we know who paid $3.75 million for a piece of cardboard. <laughs> I think he may want that negative. I said, well, it's not a negative. It's a transparency. It's a slide that they used to separate and make the plate from. But do you have it? I said, well, I sold my archive to the NHL. It's not an NHL photo. It's a WHA photo. And I was very cautious when I was doing this, when I was doing this book. I did not find those other players listed on that list. So that's telling me I was very cautious about sending out a slide or an image that was used on a product to, I was in the game before licensing. As licensing started to explode, I, I wanted to be careful that I wasn't going to screw up and send out a slide to somebody that didn't have them use it, like happened in the hockey industry a couple years ago with Upper Deck and Panini using the same photo of a rookie. And then Upper Deck got pissed, and they went into their next negotiating, so we want to be the exclusive card company. What's it going to take? And they threw out a number, and they are the exclusive card company now. And they called me up, said, can you shoot photos for us? I go, okay, yep. <laughs> but so somewhere in my storage facility, in the bottom of a box, in an envelope, is probably that, is that sheet of those players. And I, I kind of jokingly said, well, I think the guy that lost the bid and bid it up to 3.5 million and lost might even want it more. <laughs> and I basically said, if I find it, we'll touch base. Okay, we'll, we'll touch base. You know, I don't want the publicity. We'll just touch base and get me in touch with those two people and we'll just, figure something out. But I found all my Flair baseball card photos. I, you know, I shot for Flair. I was the first photographer that Flair hired after they won their lawsuit against Topps for the rights to produce baseball cards. And I don't know if you know the story there either, but in 1979, Topps, uh, Flair made a baseball card set of Ted Williams. And then in 1960-61, they did a star set. And then they turned around and got sued by Topps because Topps felt that they had the exclusivity on that because Cy Berger, the owner of Topps, was going up to the players at spring training with a catalog and they were picking a grill out, luggage bag, they were picking something out of the bag and that was his way of compensating the players back in the day. And what ended up happening was from 1961 to 1977, what happens? Players Association gets formed licensing of the team logos gets put out and now these teams can make money by selling jerseys this that whatever and and players can make more money so in reality Fleer had them on their side and they took it back to court and it was deemed a monopoly but Fleer could produce baseball cards as long as they didn't put bubble gum in the package <laughs> In the first year, they put a cracker, and that did not work. <laughs> Just from the handling, the cracker was all crinkled. And if you collected... The gum wasn't great anyway. 
Yeah. If you collected cards back in the day, you, you ended up seeing an, a sticker. It was like a card sticker. Where you could peel off your, a team logo and you could stick it on your mirror or your car or your bicycle or whatever like that. And eventually, I think they threw in another one or two more cards in the, the package, too. So that was way Fleer. And then the next thing you know, the market explodes. It just goes crazy. You know, uh, there was at one time there was six hockey card companies, and I worked for all of them. But uh, so that chapter, so here I am down. Yager goes into second place for points. And Gretzky is traveling with the Edmonton Oilers. And I'm down in Sunrise, Florida, shooting for upper deck. And I'm waiting to go to the bench for warm up. OK, I got cleared to go to the bench to shoot pictures during warm up. And Gretzky is standing right where this gentleman is right here. And he's by the door. And he knocked on the door. And he, the equipment guy comes out. And he says, tell Yags I'm here. I want to congratulate him for going into second place. And I could hear it as plain as day, because I'm right here. And then Gret the door shuts. And Gretzky kind of looks over at me like, and he puts his head down, and he puts his head up again with that stare like, do I know this guy? That's what I got the impression. And I walked over and I said, Wayne, I'm Steve Bavin of the Boston Bruins photographer. And he goes, I knew you looked familiar. I remember you when I played for the Rangers. You would stand between the benches with no glass and take pictures. And I'm saying, I can't believe you put my ugly face with the TD Garden. You see what I'm saying? And he goes, what are you doing down here? I says, I'm shooting for upper deck. They sent me down here. We got a house in Kissimmee, Florida. I come down when the Bruins go on the road. He says, well, I have a deal with upper deck. I says, no, I know that. I know that. And I says, man, I, I can't believe that. Thank you so much. And as I turned away, I go, hey, Wayne, I got one for you. I took your rookie hockey card picture. And his eyes bulged. He goes, really? Where was I playing? I said, well, you came in with the Indianapolis races at 18 years old in the WHA. You played eight games. The team folded. Your rights got picked up by the Edmonton Oilers. You were supposed to be playing a game in the Hartford Civic Center, but the roof collapsed in a snowstorm. The game got rerouted to Springfield, and you were in a game against Gordy Howe. And all of a sudden, his eyes just bulged, and he sticks out his hand. You win. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, oh, I just got to put that card in my bag. And hopefully, I run into you someday down the road. You know, my card's probably worth about $1,000. I got the US version. But you know, end of story as far as that goes. But then all of a sudden, right when COVID hits us, right, you know, the building's not at full capacity. Here we are in December. And I don't know that Wayne Gretzky is traveling with the Edmonton Oilers. And we're playing the Edmonton Oilers. And I'm walking down the long hallway with the Bruins dressing room and the visiting teams. And I'm not kidding you, Gretzky's over at the door there. And I'm like right here and I look up and he's got his hand in the air like this, the size of a card. And he's looking at me. And this is like three years later. Like, did you bring it? And I'm going, oh my God, I didn't bring it. You know? <laughs> and he just, I don't have it. And I immediately call my daughter because my daughter transmits the pictures for me. She left the house already. And then my son works in the locker room, the visiting team's locker room at that time. And he said, what's the matter? I said, Gretzky's here and I don't have the card. Go home and get it. I said, I'll get caught in traffic coming back. I'll never make it back. I got to shoot warm ups. And then he goes up to Gretzky and he says, so you were talking to my dad. Who's your dad? The one that took your rookie hockey card for it. <laughs> he goes, he didn't bring it. So anyway, here I was in Florida this year shooting at the beginning of the season for upper deck and Edmonton was playing twice. Now, Gretzky is not affiliated with the Edmonton Oilers. He's with TNT, the TV thing, okay? But he's not in any capacity like an ambassador or anything like that with the Edmonton Oilers. And one of the games I'm shooting, the first games I'm shooting, I went to Nashville, then I went down to, to uh, Tampa, and uh, it's Edmonton. So in protocol, I go up to the PR guy, and I go, I'm with Upper Deck. Yeah, I know who you are. You know, can I go to the bench? He goes, yeah, no problem. I says, is Gretzky traveling with you guys? No. I said, okay, so I shoot the game. And then there were two or three other games, and then here was Edmonton playing the Florida Panthers down in Sunrise, Florida. And I'm, they wanted me to shoot that game too. So I go down to that game, and protocol, I go back up to the PR guy just to make sure, I'm like, okay, Steve, you're all right. Now I'm Steve, okay, Steve, you're all right. No problem. And as I turn around, he goes, hey, Steve, yeah? Gretzky's here tonight. I go, what? Gretzky's here tonight. He's got a, he's got, he only lives a half an hour away from the rink. He flies up to Atlanta to do the show, and he's got his family here. I go, can I bring the book up and give him a book? And I'm not kidding. He walks out of the suite like there, and I'm over here, and he like looks at me like, like this. I go, I brought you a Christmas present, <laughs> right? And he like, 
And I go over to him. I said, remember me? I'm the guy with the card. Yeah, he says, you didn't bring the card. I says, well, I didn't forget it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but we had to go to press to get the book out for the holidays. And there's a section at the back of the book, right at the end of that chapter, that's blank white. So if you buy the book, I give you a four by six print of Gretzky and I holding the card, which you can scotch tape in. If the book goes back into press, it's going to get re-put back in the book. This, this is like the next frame to that picture that was on the card. He, he looks at the clock, and then he realizes there's still time left, and he starts to dash. So that's, that's 2.8 at 250, 400 speed film, pushed probably a half a stop. Right on the money, 2.8. There's, there's, one of the po there's one of the flash pictures right there. That's, that's him just looking back at me after a, he was straight on, and you can see the burst off the, the helmet there. And the flash obviously would have, doesn't throw that far, so that's why the background is dark. And there he is. That's the 8x10 that blows up full page. Look at Gordy's stick around his ankle. <laughs> OK. And that's, an eight, that's a 51-year-old guy and an 18-year-old guy on a face-off. This is when, the whaler, when they went to the Whalers, and I was able to go down to that first training camp, and I was able to get the three of them together. That's me playing back in the day. <laughs> Wearing Dick Clapper's number, number five. But there's my Lang helmet right there. 